this is going to be the location that we're going to use. Yeah. Cool, Scott, you ready? Yeah. Cool, so here's a talk on the, <coughs> this is the theorem proofers. Yeah, so this is a bit of a, a experimental talk. I haven't uh, attempted to do something like this uh, in public, um, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So the idea is just to tell you something about uh, the state of interactive theorem provers today and to give you some sense of how relevant or otherwise they are to modern mathematics. Um, the synopsis might be there's still a long way to go, uh, but, uh, they, but they're coming. So uh, I think the way I'll do this is I'll just start with a basically a demo session. We'll, we'll just talk to the computer for a little while and try and prove something. Uh, and then after we've done that, I'll tell you a little bit more about the bigger picture. And then maybe I'll go on to show you some examples of other things that, that uh, have been done in terms of uh, formalized mathematics. Uh, and maybe since it is mostly meant to be about uh, quantum symmetries and related things, we can conclude if we've got time by uh, proving something about tensor categories at the, at the very end. Okay, so there's, a, there's an online web editor that you can follow along if you would like to on your own computer. You can just uh, fire up this URL. Um, if you go to the Zulip forum and then click on that link, it will uh, just pop up something in your web browser, which is a perfectly functional copy of Lean. Um, you can, if you get all this crap here, you can just delete it. Um, it does run a little bit slowly in the web browser, and if you ever find yourself writing something more than about 100 lines long, you'll probably want to install a local copy, but that's fine. Okay, so, okay, let's prove something. Um, my suggestion for what we should prove uh, is that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Okay, and we'll see if we can... Ah, con oh, font bigger, yes. Is that getting bigger? Is that big enough? Okay, let's give ourselves a little bit more room. There we go. Okay, so we first of all need to tell the computer a statement <coughs> that a human will recognize as there are infinitely many primes. Does anyone have a suggestion? There are infinitely many primes. Okay, let's let's spell it out a little bit more. Maybe, uh, yeah. Oh, what's the next thing you say? Great. Okay. So for all n, uh, there exists. So notice I'm just typing little bits of LaTeX fragments when I want to get Unicode symbols, and it, it understands me pretty well. So I want to say there exists a p uh, greater than or equal to n such that p is prime. Okay. What was that? My ends are different cases. Thank you. Okay. And there are red squiggles everywhere. So the red squiggles means the computer is unhappy. It doesn't understand what we're talking about. So we go through and deal with them a few at a time. One thing is that uh, you can't just write a theorem by itself. You've also got to write the proof. And so the colon equal is, tells you you're about to start writing the proof. And at first, we're going to prove it by saying sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry is just a way of proceeding on to the rest of the development, saying you'll come back to this later. Lean just accepts sorry as a universal proof. Um, it warns you that it, it, uh, it warns you that you're using sorry, and you can tell whether a given file depends on anything that has ever used sorry. So it's only, only for the short term. And next, it tells us unknown identifier prime. And of course, this is because we've just opened up a brand new file in Lean where it really knows nothing. At the beginning of time, there's just the, the bare foundations of mathematics. In fact, not it doesn't even know what the natural numbers are at this point. So we better do a little bit to, to bring in some things. And so we'll import a file. So we'll write import data.nat.prime, which tells it about natural numbers and prime numbers and so on. And that didn't help at all. It still says unknown identifier prime. So there's just another little technicality here. We need to write open nat, where so import was importing a file where people had done stuff, but there are also namespaces, so all the definitions are collected into little groups. And so we just opened nat, because really prime, we could have written this as nat.prime, because maybe we, we also want to talk about prime ideals and so on, so we have to disambiguate by using namespaces. So we open the, the nat namespace. Okay, so now uh, things are looking pretty good. We've proved that there are infinitely many primes. Uh, and you can see that there, there's little bits of help here. If you put your cursor over the word prime, it pops up a little piece of text describing uh, what's going on. And in fact, we can, uh, we can uh, add these little pieces of text ourselves by adding comments to things. And every, anytime anyone looks at infinitude of primes later, they will see the little comment that we wrote. Um, okay. 
So what have you to say what M is mean by Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll come back and uh, talk about this quite a, well, a little bit later. Um, the foundation, the mathematical foundations of lean are independent type theory, whatever that is. Uh, so uh, in its view of the world, every mathematical object has a type. Uh, and there is a very complicated process when lean looks at uh, a term that a human has written which possibly doesn't have complete typing information, and it tries to fully elaborate the term, that is to work out the meaning of all of the symbols in it and make sure that it's a properly typed term, uh, both that everything has a type and that everything is typed correct in some sense. And so Lean is working backwards here. It's actually going and seeing that we've used this, this symbol prime here. It's, it's only got one prime in scope at the moment. No prime ideals have been mentioned so far. So the only prime it knows about is natural numbers being prime. And so from that, it works out that P must, we must be talking about P being a natural number, okay? Because we wrote prime here. Then it goes and looks at this, and it realizes I'm comparing P to something else. And at the moment, its only notion of inequality is sort of between things in the same type. So it works out that N must be a natural number as well. And then it's fully typed for the expression. So it's doing a lot of work in the background. To, 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 to type check. It's inferring a lot of information. Could this be the source of an error? Like if it works out something that you didn't mean? But yeah, absolutely. And so this is the idea is to make this user friendly. That's the whole point is to make this human understandable thing. Um, is that M? Well, so let, let's come mean? back to the point of things okay, in, right. in, a, in a moment. Yeah, yeah. There, are, there are different views on what the point of things is. Okay. Is it, is it part of what you can compare like real numbers to natural numbers? Um, yeah, it's a little bit annoying. So uh, unlike in the mathematician's view of the world where natural numbers are just real numbers, uh, there's no notion of subtyping in lean. So you really do have to have a function from the natural numbers to the reals that embeds them in. There is some, There are some conveniences in the language that mean you can avoid actually ever writing that function. And so you can, for example, tell lean, oh, think of this function from the natural numbers to the reals as a coercion. And a coercion just means if you are attempting to type check something and it looks like it doesn't type check, you are allowed to insert coercions to try to make it type check. And so if it knew that x was a natural number and y was a real number and you wrote x is less than or equal to y, Lean is clever enough to go and silently insert a coercion. So yeah, yeah. you have to be aware that those coercions exist and are happening under the hood, but a lot of the time you can avoid mentioning them or, or writing. Any other questions? I have no particular care about where I get to at the end of the hour, so feel, feel, feel free to derail as, as we go. If for some reason you wanted to write a different theorem that for every real number n, there's a prime bigger than n. Oh, yeah. You explicitly Absolutely. You yep. So I would just write uh, for all n uh, of type real. So the colon symbol is the, the typing symbol. It says this thing is of type that. Uh, and of course, it, it, it doesn't know what the real numbers are at the moment because we haven't imported anything. Uh, can you type that to get the real numbers? Uh, yeah, lean, lean is running. We just imported a big chunk of stuff, okay? It has to know about all sorts of things. Uh, but now, yeah, something has gone wrong because now it's gone, it's elaborated things the other direction. N was a real number, so now it thinks P is a real number because of this comparison, and it can't make sense of prime, okay? So we could, we could say, no, 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 I really mean... There exists P a real number such that P is greater than N and uh, and P is prime. Uh, oh, and it's still unhappy there. Uh, let's write it the other way around and it'll, okay. it'll hopefully what? make sense there. That, that way it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem was, it, the, this is a question about the coercions. Yeah. It, it was, it's clever enough to insert the coercion one way and not the other way. It's awkward. Yeah, it's a problem. Okay, let's go back a few steps and forget this nonsense about real numbers. Never heard of such things. Uh, what was that? Does a theorem have a type or is it? Yeah, no, no, no. So here, when you, uh, in, in the, this world of dependent type theory, everything has a type. And so in particular, uh, a, a proposition um, is just some type. And a proof of that proposition just means a term of that type. Okay, we interpret propositions of type as types, and the elements of those of a proposition are exactly the proofs of that proposition. So what we're doing here is we're constructing an element of this proposition. That is, we're constructing a, a proof of the theorem. So there's actually no real distinction between proving theorems and constructing data. 
in, uh, in the dependent type three world. So this colon is not overloaded at all. There's a single meaning for colon. It means we're building something of a specified type. And sorry is of every type, yeah. Okay, so there are a lot of ways we could start proving this, but usually what you do is write a begin-end block, which means that you then uh, get to construct a proof using what are called tactics. Tactics are just little instructions to the computer to help build the proof. Okay, and we get a helpful error message now. Instead of sorry, we get an error message. It says, tactic failed. There are unsolved goals. And here's... Uh, is what we still have to do. Okay, so how do you prove this theorem? What's the idea? Multiply everything together and add one. That's a good idea. We've got to go a little bit more slowly than that. The very, very first thing you would write down on a piece of paper, to a human here would write, let n be a natural number. Okay, and so let's do that. So let's just see what happened. As we move the cursor around inside a begin end block, we can see the state of the proof. At the beginning, uh, of the begin end block, the goal is here. It's a it's a for all statement for all natural numbers something. Okay, then after we write intro n, the goal slightly changes. Now we have a hypothesis, some fixed natural number. So the things written before this turnstile symbol are our hypotheses, variables we kind of have in scope and available to us. And after the turnstile is what we have left to prove. So you can see the goal is ever so slightly changing, and this line corresponds to exactly what's happening when a mathematician says let x be a real number. Let and is not given by this statement of the theorem? There's a... Um, we, we, yeah, we, we could write this statement very, very slightly differently. We could have written this as an argument to the theorem and we move the universal quantifier and then we wouldn't need the intro statement. Then you, you would see the, the it would already be there. But uh, I think it's maybe conceptually easier to have the for all in the intro. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the usually when you write existential statements, you're meant to write, there exists something of some type, such that something. <laughs> but there's a little bit of just syntactic sugar that you can just leave out the type of the thing that you're asserting exists. And uh, Lean, is, Lean is inserting that in for us. It's realizing that what we really meant is there exists a P and a proof that P is greater than or equal to N and a proof that, that P is prime. So this is, this is really just a piece of shorthand. So... A Q is a proof of the fact that P is greater than or equal to N. Exactly. We don't have that yet. Our job is to produce a P and a proof. Yeah. Is, it, is it smart enough? And I imagine this might come up more in like analytic type proofs that the N in your proof doesn't match the N in your quantified state. Like you instead now construct a proof <coughs> oh, of N over 2. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's you, 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 you can't do undergraduate maths wrong. It'll, it'll, tell, it'll, tell, you, yeah, it'll tell you this depended on that. <laughs> Okay, so the, the, the idea of the proof was we multiply everything together. So um, let's um, maybe just say let m uh, colon equals, we'll define something. Let's let that be factorial n plus 1. Okay, so this is a bit unfortunate. I couldn't write an exclamation mark like we're used to writing. We could set up that notation actually, but we haven't done it. Okay, and then what are we meant to do after we've thought about factorial plus 1? The next thing we're meant to do is... Um, take the minimum prime factor of that, fac of that factorial plus one, and we'll make the argument about that. So again, at this point, you can see a little bit of a problem. I had to know that the factorial was called fact, and I had to know that there was this function out there called minfac, which extracted the smallest prime factor from, a, from an actual number. I'll show you a little bit later some tricks for learning the names of theorems, according to, to Lean. But once you get the hang of it, they're actually all named in very uniform ways. One would never, ever name a theorem in Lean Burnside's theorem, you would write out some statement that uh, once you get the hang of it, says exactly what Burnside's theorem says, and Burnside's theorem would only appear in the explanatory text, so you could search for it. Okay, so naming is a skill. It's a little bit like learning French, but uh, only learning mathematical French. Not, and these um, names are contained in nat? Uh, yeah, minfac here, if we hover the mouse over it, you'll see the, full, the fully qualified name is nat.minfac. So it's something particular to natural numbers. Okay. So we've got our p that we propose to use. Um, we could just now uh, write use p. Okay, we're trying to prove an existential statement. And so this is telling Lean, uh, well, I want to solve this existential statement with that particular thing. Okay, and that then leaves us the goal of proving that p is greater than n and p is prime. In fact, 
I I've thought about this this argument a little bit earlier, and I happen to know that it, it's helpful to prove that p is prime first before we get started. So let's let's do that. So let's just assert a fact that p is prime. Uh, but let's not prove it at the moment. Let's just write sorry for that little fact. So have is a way of introducing a new hypothesis, which you're obviously obligated to prove at that moment. So you can see after the have and the sorry statement, I have a new, I have a new fact, the fact that p is prime. Okay, we were meant to have proved in that moment when we said sorry. So since you have to prove that p is prime, what does min fact do then? Ah, yeah, min fact is just a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. All that it does is produces a, produces a, whatever the smallest prime factor is. Now you've got to be a little bit careful here um, that uh, very often it makes sense in, in these languages to define total functions rather than partial functions. That is, we would prefer not to have a function from the natural numbers along with a proof that that natural number is at least two to the natural numbers to produce the minimum factor. We'd just like to have a function from natural numbers to natural numbers. But of course, it's not going to make any sense on zero and one. Okay, you can't, there's not a sensible answer. What is the smallest prime factor of zero or one? But instead, instead what we do is just define a total function that just works, possibly that gives nonsensical answers on zero and one. And we defer to the, the, the separate lemma that asserts that the, the result really is prime to, 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 to state the side conditions. Uh, that, that our, our input was sensible. And maybe a very similar thing here is the, that in, in lean, the, the default definition of subtraction on the natural numbers says that uh, 2 minus 3 equals 0. Okay? So it doesn't satisfy all the laws that you might think satisfy, or it's, it's, it's defined on all pairs of natural numbers, but we only assert the theorems about natural numbers behaving properly with the inequalities. In them. But the function is just defined everywhere. So we're doing a similar thing. Oh, you just end up having to prove it twice. You'll see, see here we've got two things we need to prove. We need to prove that p is greater than n and that p is prime. It turns out you need to know that p is prime uh, in showing that p is greater than or equal to n. So we're just going to need it in both branches of the, of the next argument. So you might as well prove it first. Okay. okay, so we have now have this existential statement we need to prove with two facts. And so let's just write split, which uh, turns that into two separate goals. We need to separately prove p is greater than or n, and we need to prove that p is prime. Okay. So uh, once you've got multiple goals to work on, it's helpful to use curly braces to, uh, to, to sort of structure your proof a little bit. The curly braces just say, I'm only going to work on the first, the first goal at the moment, and I'll, and I'll finish that goal by the end of the curly braces. Split, split, every conjunction is split is pretty powerful. It does a, it does a lot of things. It, uh, um, uh, split works on the goal. I mean, yeah. So if the goal is is a, um, yeah, if, if the goal is a is an inductive type that has a single constructor, split gives you a separate goal for each argument of that constructor. So it does it does something quite general. Okay. So we're trying to prove that p is greater than or equal to n. We have to remember some maths now. What do you do to prove p is greater than or equal to n at this point? Yeah, one mod n. Um, yeah, so, so actually the, the easiest way to do it is to do it by contradiction. So we write by contradiction. And now our goal is um, a little bit annoying. We're meant to prove false now. Uh, but we've got a hypothesis that is not the case that p is greater than or equal to n. Because it's a bit daft. So let's just write um, simp at a. Simp is a very powerful tactic that runs a simplifier, which is this infinitely customizable gadget. Uh, and the, the hypothesis it is not the case that p is greater than or equal to n has just become p is less than n. Okay, that seems really, pretty reasonable. How are we going to get there now? Dave had the idea we're going to prove some divisibility facts. We're going to prove, first of all, the fact that um, p divides. So I have a little Unicode divide symbol there, which I had to write as slash pipe. Uh, first of all, what I want to do, I want to... I want to use this, what should be a relatively simple fact that it divides m. After all, it's meant to be the minimum factor. So that should be easy. So let's write sorry for now and come back to it later. Um, the next thing we need to know is that p divides uh, factorial n. 
And that should be only slightly harder. That one should follow just from the fact. No, 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 N, fact N, yeah, yeah. So this fact, H2, should follow from the fact that uh, because we're doing this proof by contradiction, we've set up that P is less than N, okay? And therefore it divides N factorial. So we've got those two facts. Uh, then using those two, we should be able to derive that P divides 1. What do you do H sub 1, H sub 2? Uh, just H slash underscore 1. And then finally, it should be really easy because we've got something that we know is prime and it divides one, and that's a contradiction. So it should be easy at that point. Okay, so that's the rough outline of that branch of the argument. And now what's the, what do we have left over after all of that? Um, Sorry, Scott, I type yeah. h slash underscore one. Press space again. Space. Yeah, it only, the slash instructions only um, kind of compile <laughs> to Unicode after you hit space afterwards. Did that work? Eventually. Okay. Um, okay. And so, what's our last? Oh, sorry, we're oh, it's running a bit slowly here. This is unfortunate. Okay. Finally, it's caught up in the second branch after we've moved out of these curly braces. We just need to the fact that p is prime, but we proved that earlier, so we can just write uh, by assumption. That is, we've, we, the goal is exactly one of the things we already know. Okay, so at that point, Lean should report it's happy. There are no errors, except that there should be uh, a warning somewhere that we've used sorry a whole lot. Okay, great. No errors, but declaration uses sorry. Okay, so um, let's... Um, which one is going to be... Okay, I, th I think at this point I'm going to start cheating a little bit or showing you some, some tricks for cheating. <laughs> Um, let me, there must be some lemma that says this, that, uh, if, um, um, that if P was defined to be the minimum factor of M, then, uh, I need to put braces around it for some reason, uh, then, then it should divide M. Uh, there must be some lemma asserting that, and so I type library search, and it tells me, yes, there is indeed a lemma giving me this fact. It is called min fact divide which is a pretty sensible name, maybe, for the fact that the minimum factor divides the thing you started with. And so we can, uh, we can copy and paste that. And what did the exact mean? On the uh, so, yeah, exact is just a tactic that says, uh, here is a term of type the current goal. Okay, so it just says, here's your answer. If your goal was a natural number, you can just write exact seven to hand it, hand it the number seven. Okay. And so now Lean accepts that. Uh, Okay, and so one of our sorrows is gone. Let me, at this point, um, do something which I can't do in the um, um, in the online version of Lean because this is sort of a bit of a an experimental feature. But there are actually some kind of cool pieces of automation that we can uh, stick in here. And in fact, all of these sorrows require no human effort whatsoever, and the computer will happily go and explain how to solve all of these remaining problems for us, hopefully. Uh. Sorry, why is it? If you're trying to prove for PP here, yeah. could you just somehow prove that P is bigger than one or something like this? Like, don't you? Like somehow, it's because it's a min fact of n, you just have to yeah, so, it's not zero. So, so let's, let's actually see the proof that, um, that Lean produced of this fact. It said that the proof that p was prime was min fact prime any e of greater than suck less than suck fact pos n. Okay, let's, let's uh, so first of all, let's, let's take that and just write it in and just see that that proof really did work. Um, let me just change these back to sorries for a moment so we don't have to sit here waiting for it to compile everything or waiting for it to search for proofs. Okay, so it accepts that proof, but let's, uh, let's, let's work out this proof ourselves uh, because um, it's nice to understand what was going on. So instead, I'll just enter a new begin-end block to work on this sub-goal, okay? 
And so maybe you, it occurs to me, oh yeah, like uh, of course the minimum factor is prime. That's how it, what it's defined to be. And I guess that the lemma is meant to be called apply min fact prime. And this gives us a new goal. Oh, sorry, I needed a comma down there. This gives us a new goal. It, we need to know that m is not equal to 1 because min fact 1 just returns 1, okay? So that won't be prime. And you can see if we look at min fact prime, the, the type is exactly, it takes a natural number and a proof that it's not equal to 1 and asserts that min fact is prime. Okay, so you can kind of work backwards by using this apply statement. You can say, I know that the, f the final step of the proof is this lemma. So let's apply that lemma. And then it, work, it tells you all the hypotheses of that lemma it can't solve. And so then we think, ah, oh, why do we know that m is, uh, m is not 1? Oh, clearly m is greater than 1 in the way we've set things up. And so we remember that there's a lemma not equal of greater than, uh, which tells you that, and now the goal is proving that m is greater than 1. Yes? What's the proper syntax for getting not just a vertical line, but the vertical line? Yeah, uh, slash pipe, space. Oops, slash pipe, and then hit space, and it will convert to a Unicode, oh. a Unicode divide. That was Sorry, yep. Uh, okay, uh, and so now we need to prove that m is greater than 1. Why do we know m is greater than 1? Yeah, so m was something plus 1. So if we what, we, what we actually need to do here is use the fact, so we're trying to prove that m is greater than the successor of 0, and we know that m is the successor of something. So a good way we can prove this is by using this lemma, suck less than suck. <laughs> which asserts that if A is less than B, the successor of A is less than the successor of B, now we're left with the fact that we need to prove that the factorial N is greater than zero, and maybe we don't remember the name of that lemma, so we type library search. Oh, I'm working in a branch that doesn't have library search, um, but back works, and it says, oh yeah, that's called fact pos N, and so we, we can write apply fact pos. So notice here a difference just between apply and exact. Exact, you had to tell it exactly the thing you wanted, apply uh, tries to work out the, the arguments necessary. So here, we just applied fact pos. We didn't tell it fact pos n. It worked out that the only sensible way to use that lemma was to substitute in the n we're talking about. OK. And so hopefully, we can go back here now. Um, so how is back question mark finding proofs? Yeah, it's complicated. Okay. Um, the if it actually runs, I think this one here is actually the longest, the longest of them. Um, but is it like looking through the NAT, like all the? Like yeah. So knows that well, so here, here's the lemma that it here's the fact that it here's the proof that it produced. <laughs> it's some giant multi-line thing. It actually, you can simplify that a little bit if you try. But it it's uh, <coughs> using all these crazy facts that. It's using the fact that it's prime, and it does some tricks with inequalities. It uses the fact that primes don't divide one. It's yeah, it's gone and basically circled this tree of possible applications of lemmas, following some clever heuristic to like try and consider that it makes progress when it successfully uses a local hypothesis and things like this. Yep. Um, yeah, but I mean, you would never one of these expensive tactics like back that does some search. You would never leave in the final proof when you ship it off to other people somehow. You would you would sort of take the compiled output of that search. Um, right, but I, does it give up at some point? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, it gives up. Yeah, and you can set the time limits and so on. We have just done back for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Yeah, um, and so you'll notice I have another tab here uh, called using back. Uh, so this is the, the, the shortest I could get this proof down to uh, using the existing technology in Lean. So we just, right out there, we don't have those have statements, we set things up, we just go right out there and say, oh yeah, use P, the minimum factor of factorial n plus one. And then, then we've got two branches to prove. We have to prove some inequality and we need to prove some primeness condition. In the first branch, we need to give Lean the hint that it's meant to do a proof by contradiction. Uh, we still need to, unfortunately, do the simp that replaces the not greater than with less than, and then back does the rest, and if you hover the cursor over here and see the proof term it produces, it's gone and done some genuine work, like it's produced all those bits. And then the other one was, was reasonably easy, that was proving primality in the other branch. Um, so yeah, there's some amount of automation and... and How much longer would the search be had you not written by contradiction? It just wouldn't have worked. Yeah, back, back <coughs> I, I mean, we can, we can try it. Um, 
back immediately says, actually, it very quickly returns and says, I couldn't do anything with that, sorry, didn't know what to do. Um, does it does it learn like when it finds a solution? Does it remember that this was a good solution? Um, and next time it should. No, I mean everything is sort of stateless in that sense. Um, if you you can tag lemmas in various ways and say, oh yeah, this is a really good one for using when you're trying to run back, and then back will pay attention and try and use that one. It doesn't do that. Either. No, you've got to give it some hints to. Yeah, library search, which I think I maybe demonstrated when we were back in the web browser. Um, automatically learns. It just searches everything that's been imported and tries to see if by a single application of a lemma in the library and local hypotheses, can I close the goal? And, uh, it, uh, okay. So, any questions about this example or the... Any more? We can talk about some, some general stuff. It just proves that there's arbitrary large trends. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's just bigger than every yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it's true that we really should say something about the set of primes being infinite. And, yeah. yeah, you, 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 can, you can do all those things in lean, I assure you. Don't worry. Um, okay, so, okay, so let, let's make some general remarks before we go back and look at, uh, at any other code. So the first question is why do this? Like why, why care about the existence of pieces of software that let you do things like this? Anyone have some suggestions of why, why this could matter? Maybe if you run out of research topics that you can answer, you just decide to do this instead. <laughs> Ouch. Um, just yeah. one possible so, so the uh, that, that's not usually the answer people give. Um, <laughs> it, could, it could tell you, like, maybe you yeah, yeah. So th this is, uh, I mean, this is a great answer because it's absolutely not the answer that you hear when you talk to computer scientists or talk to people who do formalization of mathematics. Um, they will uh, instead tell you, oh, there's a crisis in mathematics. All the theorems are broken and nothing actually gets proved and no one knows the status of X and Y and Z and so on. Which. Uh, I, I can introduce you to hordes of people. I was at a conference last week where, like, that, yeah, I, oh yeah, I mean, it's tr it's tr it's true. I mean, it's a it's a true fact. I mean, the classification of finite simple groups is the one they live to, love to give. Yeah, the proof's not written down, and the people are getting kind of old, and it's un unclear whether that'll ever get finished. Um, the all of modern symplectic topology is probably just well. Okay. Uh, I mean, there are several more thousand-page foundation of papers that need to be written before hundreds of papers in symplectic topology are, are really connected back down to the ground. I mean, there are, there are some huge gaps there. And I think there are increasingly some big gaps in, in our subject, in, in, in higher category theory, um, in, 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 a, in a lot of different directions. Um, the, okay, so, yeah, so there's, of course, the question of how much you ought to worry about these gaps. Um, I mean... If they don't, if they're not real gaps, everything is actually true, then who cares? We can get on with it and, and, and enjoy ourselves explaining theorems to each other. Um, but obviously it's a hassle if it, everything turns out to, to be wrong and you have to rebuild subjects after the fact. But there's no real sign that that's actually happened so far. Okay? It seems like it's going to be even harder to convince these people to write these proofs than it is to get them to just write the paper in the first place. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. And so, I mean, I, I don't, uh, personally, I don't care very much about this explanation that, about the gaps in the literature. Um, I don't think that these sort of tools are, are going to solve that, can solve that problem. Yeah, no, but, but so I think um, the earlier answer is a, is a good one, um, which is that, these systems at the moment are not good enough to actually be helpful. It's frankly excruciating to prove anything in these systems. Uh, and even worse, uh, when designing, when, when doing big bits of theory, there's a skill set involved in setting things up in the computer that mathematicians just genuinely don't have. There's a, um, well, I mean, by default, mathematicians don't have, or aren't trained to, to, to have. There's a whole kind of uh, sort of interface design issue, the, the putting together big chunks of theory in a way that people can use afterwards that mathematicians, I think, are, are bad at. So, okay, so that's all difficult. But these things are, these, these theorem proofs are rapidly getting better. And 
Uh, and I think it's pretty plausible that uh, we are going to find ourselves in the situation that at least some parts of the work we do, the computers will be good enough that they can exactly do this. You can say, oh, surely this just works by inducting on n then k, and checking something, and it will go off and say, ah, oh, no, sorry, that doesn't work because you end up with this case. And uh, it's never, I mean, I don't believe at all the, the machine learning people who say that uh, they're going to prove the Riemann hypothesis or something by, by a big pile of linear algebra staring at previous theorems, uh, which is basically what they say. Um, so the, the conceptual stuff is still going to be ours, but just like we already use computer algebra software, and if you don't use computer algebra software in your research, then you're doing it wrong, um, <laughs> then uh, um, just like we use computer algebra software today to make us better mathematicians, this stuff is going to, is going to get there, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Uh, at, at least for, for parts of what we do. Uh, yeah? So here's an example. What if you want to uh, compute, not, compute some uh, three manifold invariant from some modular category that's a gauging of another one, right? Yep. That you have the data for. Yep. And then if you want to compute this, all, the mod, all, the, all the data for this modular category, it's going to be some mass and dependent type, right? Sure. So um, it might be easier to do that using a dependent type theory, uh, using uh, like better static, static typing than to keep track of every tiny little base, like every tiny little basis, uh, like a bunch of vectors of stuff, right? Yeah. So, so that's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think more, more generally, um, I mean, I don't think I've found this yet in, um, in sort of doing real maths, because this stuff isn't quite at the point of doing, doing real maths yet. Um, I mean, I was, I was sitting there uh, last night uh, uh, formalizing and leaning little bits of what, uh, what Jamie told us uh, yesterday afternoon. So, but I, I don't want to at all uh, say that that means it's not, it's not real maths. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but but the, no, the, 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 a really fascinating thing that, that you do see is you've done some big development, you had some definitions and a whole lot of theorems, and you realize you want to tweak the definition a little bit. And the speed with which the computer identifies where things go wrong later is kind of amazing. And you can already see in that situation, like the, the idea of refactoring a proof or refactoring some definitions, um, that the computer is already helpful for identifying where things go wrong or, or which theorems need to be done differently. Uh, and I think, yeah, it, things like that are going, to, are going to get better and better. Uh, can you just summarize again this alternate answer to the other one? I don't think I quite picked up the general statement about what you, why you should do this besides fixing the gaps. Um, okay, so, so the, the, the answers that, that people historically have given is so that we can be confident that the mathematical literature is correct, um, so that we don't have to pretend that we're, people are refereeing details of papers carefully because the computer will object it. The, those are, I'm not, very, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not very convinced of either of those answers. Um, I think the, the, the stronger one is that uh, I think that, I mean, we spend a lot of our time having a big idea about a problem. Uh, and then realizing, oh, that, if this idea is right, then I'm going to have to go and do X, Y, and Z. And then we all walk a somewhat dangerous line, thinking, oh, Z's surely going to work. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of omit saying that anything is going on there, and I'll, I'll explain to the readers X and Y. And we all, we all do this all of the time. And I think we all make mistakes doing this, and very frequently find that we omitted Y, but at least sort of in giving seminar talks about the subject for a couple of years, and then we finally get around to writing the paper, and like, oh, crap, why is kind of complicated? And I think that the thing that's going to happen is that the computers are going to gradually work their way up. They'll do the Zs that are, that are really easy and just work, and then we'll just gradually start getting used to giving them more of the, can you check Y for me, and getting a useful answer back when it says I can't do it, because the, it can't, it's saying I can't do it, will actually reveal where, where a piece of difficulty was. And it's going to more, give us a more efficient way of actually going and doing interesting stuff. What's your answer does it give with back fails? Like, yeah, back is not very hopeful. Back indeed says failed. <laughs> um, the, so it doesn't expose the front. No, exactly no, so back doesn't. doesn't, doesn't. The, the square root of 4 is irrational or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> what answer does it get? Well, so back actually doesn't entirely say failed. Uh, back has some, uh, treats the lemmas that it takes as input in a few different ways, and it can treat some of them as. You can tell it that some lemmas are obviously good ideas. That is, um, if you can successfully apply the lemma, even if you can't later fill in the hypothesis of that lemma, 
you should apply it anyway and report back to the human the progress you made applying that lemma even if you didn't finish. Whereas other lemmas it's not so confident about and it treats it as well, I'll try applying it. But if I can't then fulfill the later hypotheses, I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack and not, and not even report to the human. And so in that sense, it does give you progress sometimes. It says, well, I got, it, I got this far. And, and you're, you're, you're over-imagining what, what, what back does. Um, It'll tell you I can prove that, but it won't tell you, you fool, that's wrong. Um, uh, oh, I needed to give it a name. Uh, uh, why? Is, oh, buy, I need to write buyback. To, and it just says, tactic failed. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. But it, it made progress. Look, at it, this is amazing. It, it, it succeeded a little bit. It came back and said, well, I couldn't get there. But if you can prove that one is less than zero, <laughs> <laughs> then I've got it for you. And that's pretty reasonable. Like, that's a simpler statement that is yeah, going to be right. easier to... If it's true, it's going to be easier to prove. Than to but it doesn't recognize that something is actually... No, that's not Back's job. Back, Back's job is... Back is not... I mean, Back is a backwards reasoner. It, uh, it tries applying lemmas against the goal and works exactly. Is there a way that you can... Is there something like Back except it's closer to, like, to side? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, so, um, this one... Let, let's prove the theorem that's true, okay? Uh, it's not the case that 2 is less than 1. And uh, what do I write? I think I just write deck trivial, which says, uh, I assert that there is a decision procedure for this question. Please go and run it. And it's su lean successfully recognizes that you've asserted that, goes and looks through its memory and realizes, oh, yeah, I do have a decision procedure for deciding inequalities between natural numbers. Let me run it on two is less than one for you. And, and it gives you the answer. Right, so I, but I meant, I meant question but like so I, I have a hypothesis yeah. that I think might be true or false and I want lean to go see if it can prove either yeah so so you, you you try proving one and you try proving its negation and you but, see which one it's happy about that it's somehow like easy to do yeah so there's a decision like, procedure not saying like do whatever you can to go no no it says go and look up to see if someone has registered a decision procedure for this class of problems right. if so run it so this is not like a generalization of that this is a no this is a completely yeah, different yeah, yeah. A different and the generalization What time did I start and what time? Uh, did half I, I started at half past. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, 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 sure. What's the difference or similarity between semicolon and equal when you use them to prove something and when you use them to define something? Ah, yeah. So, um, there is a slight difference. Um, Lean has an interesting notion called proof irrelevance. Um, so everyone in the community has nice t-shirts. The proof is irrelevant. Um, but uh, so all of this says is that any, it asserts, it's an axiom in Lean's, in Lean's system that asserts that any two proofs of the same statement are equal, okay? Which um, enables you to, to do a certain amount of lack of bookkeeping. You don't need to remember which proofs you're carrying around to do things. Uh, and in particular, um, this means that there is a slight difference between writing theorem for and definition foo, which is that theorem will actually discard the proof after it's been proved, or check there was a proof, but they're not carried around for the rest of time. And it can, it, that's a viable thing to do in lean because of proof irrelevance in the axiomatics. Uh, on the other hand, it makes lean an unfriendly place to do homotopy type theory, where, where you, proof irrelevance uh, plus new valence gives you a contradiction. So, so there. Yeah. Does that, does it, yeah. Yeah, so there's sort of a, um, yeah, so the, the, the first, in some sense, there's a big axiomatic divide between whether you use, um, well, yeah, basically whether you use uh, dependent type theory or, uh, or some form of a simple type theory or, uh, or you just work in, in first order logic as your, sort of, as your foundations. If you work over here, you've got to do all of ZFC as a sort of second layer above doing first order logic. Somehow dependent type theory is an alternate foundations of mathematics that sort of does sort of does the equivalent of the first order logic meta theory and the ZFC axioms kind of all in one in one package. But anyway, so you've got this divide about which axiomatics you like. I couldn't care less. Um, I've never seen ZFC written down on a piece of paper. I don't know what it says. Um, but dependent type theory um, 
is just this idea that everything, so first of all, type theory is just this idea that everything has a type, uh, and so you don't have uh, the idiotic statements um, that, that hold in ZFC. Oh, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Uh, okay. This statement, 3 is a topology on 2, is both a syntactically correct statement in ZFC and a true statement. Okay? First of all, it's syntactically correct just because everything is a set, so at the level of checking types, you can't even see that this makes no sense. In dependent type theory, it's rubbish. These are natural numbers. They're not sets of subsets to begin with. But this, because of this idiotic encoding, in Z, the standard encoding like of natural numbers as, as sets, this really is true. Like This is a set of subsets of two that is closed under yada, 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 yada. Okay. And so, in some sense, sort of obviously, mathematicians aren't using this because we all recognize that this is both syntactically uh, ill-typed and, and false. And dependent type theory, uh, or so dependent type theory on top of just general type theory, is just this notion that one type can depend on another type. And so when you want to talk about schemes, you say like a, a scheme is a space equipped with a something, and that something sort of dependent on which space you specify. So the, the dependent type theory language is, I think, very natural to mathematicians. OK, so that's the axiomatic side of things. Your choices for theorem provers um, I mean, there are lots, and I'll offend lots of people who fortunately aren't here in the room, um, but your choices are basically um, to use some variety of Isabel, which lives off in that column, and is a very well-established theorem prover that's been around for a long time, um, and in particular has lots of analysis done in it. Uh, and then off over in this world, uh, you have Cock, and you have Reed, and I wouldn't bother if I was a mathematician trying to learn about any of the others, there are lots out there. And all the authors of them will be very upset that I told that, told mathematicians to not even bother. Um, Koch and Lean are essentially, uh, essentially isomorphic. They have almost exactly the same foundational setup. They deal with universe polymorphism. It's like dealing how you cope with Russell's paradox in slightly different ways. Um, but it's not a really important one. Essentially, the difference here is that Koch has a large existing community amongst French mathematicians. People, French mathematicians actually have heard of it, unlike in the rest of the world, uh, when people haven't heard of any of these. Um, uh, Lean came along much later and has nicer syntax, less crazy ways of organizing namespaces and imports and various things, and one really, really profound difference. Uh, you'll notice, I mean, so I was showing you this back tactic and this library search tactic and this use tactic and so on. Uh, a fantastic thing about Lean is that those are all just written in Lean itself in the same language that you do mathematics. I mean, Lean is a full programming language, and indeed, it's a, as of the next version, it's, a, it's meant to be a very fast programming language, like very fast programming language. Uh, so you can just write these tactics in the language itself, and as you write the tactics, you can interact with the mathematics. Your, your tactics can know about theorems and use them and so on. But the, the, the idea of a tactic is just something that... Uh, that uh, takes this goal state, the hypotheses and the goals, and manipulates it in various allowed ways. Okay, that, that's all it is. It's a program for helping you write proofs. And Lean makes it way, way easier to write tactics, not quite to the point where I'd say a mathematician can write tactics, but I'll assert that by, by an existence statement, there, there are some mathematicians who can write tactics, like Back is, is one of mine. Um, but and I think that's the sort of the big thing that, that's, that's coming, that it's going to be more and more easy to write new programs that help you construct the proof in these newer languages. And that's the reason to care about Lean over the others. What about proof of relevance? Can that be turned off Lean? Uh, no, it can't be turned off. So yeah. that's another big difference? Yeah, yeah. So the, um, in, in some sense, it's part of universe issues. It's, it's, how, you, it's how you treat the lowest universe level. Um, um, Why might you want to turn off proof of relevance? No, I don't have time to give a talk on homotopy <laughs> type theory. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we, we can talk about it later. It's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, going a bit into how Lean works. So when you are trying to use a theorem, are you like pointing the theorem at something? Or are you like, like how does it work in like programming? Like, do you point theorems? Are theorems objects? What is the, the functions? Let's, um, everything is a term that has some type. 
no exceptions. That's that's the and so every time you write a theorem, you're constructing a term of some type. That type might be a, a proposition, which means the term is is a, is a proof of that. Let's define the type. What is the type? Okay. Let's 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 go have a look, have a quick look. Um, uh, what's a good one to look at? Uh, okay. Let, let's. Um, okay. Here, in the last couple of minutes, um, we're just going to jump in right in the middle of things, uh, where we've already set up the theory of monoidal categories and functors between monoidal categories and so on. That's all in the the main lean library, and so let's start doing something with that. So. Here, what's going on? Uh, I'm importing something that brings in some stuff about monoidal functors. I'm dealing with namespaces. I'm doing category theory, so at the end of the day, I do have to worry about universes because some categories are small and some categories are large, and it just sucks. But okay. Uh, and then we we say we set up some variables that just says locally in the rest of this file. C is some some sort. I could just write type here, sort and type are for the purposes of today's synonyms. And I have and I and I know how objects of that type form a monoidal category. I know how to tensor them, and I have a notion of homes between them and all that stuff. Okay, and now I'm just defining a new type here. I'm defining a monoid. Okay, so what does a monoid consist of? A monoid consists of six pieces of data. It consists of something called A, which is of type C. That's the object of the category we're working in. It consists of an, an iota, which is a morphism from the tensor unit of C to that A. And this arrow here is not just the usual function arrow in lean, like the functions from natural numbers to reals or whatever, it's a little home arrow. And lean is going back and when it sees that notation there, it's thinking, oh crap, I need to work out if there's a category instance around what's on the left hand side, what's on the right hand side of the arrow. Uh, they both look like they're of type C. Do I, have a, do I know how to think of C as a, as, a, uh, as a category? And because of this little incantation here, it says, oh yeah, okay. I know how to think of C as a category. And so I understand what the user meant by writing that little home arrow. Okay, it's doing all that thinking as it reads that line. I've got a multiplication, which is a map from A tensor A to A, and then I've got some axioms about how that multiplication interacts with the, the pentagon and so on. Okay? What was that? Yeah, so um, we could just remove these, uh, but what happens is that um, when we um, when we construct an instance of a monoid, we have to give it six things, a and iota and mu and the, these three proofs. Writing dot something at the end of a field in a structure tells lean, if the user omits this one, please don't complain. Before you complain, please try running this tactic to see if you can generate that, 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 that thing yourself. And obviously is a kind of cool tactic that, that does a bunch of work. And in the category theory library is used very widely to avoid ever having to prove anything, basically. All of the functoriality and naturality conditions tend to just get done by, by automation. And that's what the obviously is doing here. OK, we have some random incantations down here, um, which I uh, won't explain. They're to do with setting up, obviously, and the simplifier to tell it it's allowed to use those axioms now. Uh, I think since I uh, have, I was going to fill in the rest of this file live and define a module over a monoid and then show that the modules over a monoid form a category. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, let me, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so here's another copy of basically the same file. It's a slightly different definition of monoid. Instead of calling things iota and mu, they're called unit and product, which is a little bit of a, a little bit annoying. Oh, well, no, I mean, this is the axiom. This is, this really is the Pentagon axiom. Uh, oh, but why is the structure monoid? Then, not monoid? Oh yeah, uh, why did is that called Pentagon? I think this is called Pentagon actually because a student wrote this and I copied and pasted and didn't really pay attention to what they'd done yet. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, all of this is saying is uh, is this axiom for monoids, and I agree that that should not be called Pentagon. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They've called it Pentagon because there really are five things. You reassociate, you do the product, and then you do the product, or you do the product and the product. Okay. Um, okay. And so then we set up module in basically the same way. 
Now notice uh, for monoid, we just wrote structure monoid colon equals and then put in the bits and pieces. For module, we parameterize it. We're, we're defining a module over a fixed monoid. So this type is parameterized by another type. This is an example of a dependent type. And we specify, okay, so here's some object. In, it's got some object M and it's got an action map. And it's also got some axioms. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in a pretty similar way, we define a new structure, which is a type depending on two different modules, which is the type of module morphisms. So it consists of a morphism from the underlying object of M to the underlying object of N, and some axiom uh, about playing well with the actions. And we tell Lean that it's allowed to try and prove that by itself. And we tell Lean that it's allowed to use that axiom later when trying to prove things by itself. Uh, we then prove a little helper ax a little helper lemma here that says if you've ever got two different homes between the same between modules M and N, to prove that they are equal, it suffices to prove that their underlying maps are equal. This is an, sort of an easy consequence of proof irrelevance. Remember, two maps just consist of a map between the underlying objects and a proof about those maps, and we're just stating you don't need to check anything about the proofs because they're they're automatically the same. Okay. And then we finally come to setting up the category of modules, and you can see that it's really quite simple. To specify the category of modules in A, all that we do is say, well, the homes in this category are, so lambda here is just a, the, the, the computer scientist's way of writing slash maps to. It's, a, it's the way of setting up an anonymous function without naming it. So this is a function that takes M and N and spits out some type, the type of homes from M to N, which is just that structure we defined a moment ago. Then we define identities, so we say, well, given a module M, we need to build a, a home from M to M, and so this curly brace notation is the syntax for building instances of structures, and so we tell it what F should be, F should just be the identity map on the underlying object, and notice we just leave out W, we don't specify what W is, and Lean goes away in the background and successfully proves that, uh, that the identity does satisfy the, uh, the, the required map. And then we define composition. So given three modules and two morphisms, we define a new home. And again, we just specify the underlying map. It checks that it really does, does play with the, the, um, the action map correctly. But notice that we really should do several more things here. If we're setting up a category, you would expect to have to write, oh, and composing with an identity does nothing, and composing is associative, and check all those things. We just don't write those things, because we wrote dot obviously in all the correct places. And Lean is just going away and proving and checking all those facts by itself. Uh, so the, the the pain, I mean, it's really not. The, you, I don't think you could really argue that that definition ought to be shorter. You can complain about having to learn the syntax, but we're really just saying exactly the facts that you need to say and nothing more. And that's the aspiration: try and build up the automation at the same time as you build up the theory, so that the things that are too easy to state uh, don't get stated. Um, I did have a bunch of other things to to show you. Um, Maybe, oh, it's not. <coughs> People have done some serious mathematics. Uh, here's the, the definition of a, of a perfectoid space. This is the thing that Peter Schultz got a Fields Medal for a year or two ago. It's, it's some serious mathematics. There's lots of number theory and lots of algebraic geometry in there. Uh, they did this basically as an experiment. Like, What's a really, really, really deep stack of theorems and definitions layered on top of each other? Can we do this in Lean just to see if it's possible? And indeed, yes, it's possible. You can, you can at least make the definitions uh, of modern Fields metal work <laughs> accessible to Lean. Not claiming anything about examples or theorems, but the definitions already is quite an achievement. And How do you know if you have to find something correct? What's that? How do you know if your definition is correct? Yeah. Like um, uh, so you re you read the definition and see that it says what you think it says, um, li like one does in, in human mathematics. Um, you construct some examples and check the examples that you expect to satisfy the definition do satisfy the examples, and you start proving the basic theorems. And once you've done that, you have the confidence that uh, that, a, that a normal human has. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. So, because we noticed that I, we, we said you had to check the definitions and you need to check the statements of the theorems. But the proofs you don't. The proofs you really don't have to look at. 
And if you think about the division of labor when you're judging other people's mathematics, which one's the hard one? Uh, Nobody's ever, ever checked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ob obviously is doing the work, and it spits an error message if it fails. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, what the, the final thing to say is there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of mathematics uh, done in Lean at, at this moment. Um, there is, uh, <coughs> there are perfectoid spaces, and there are schemes, and there are theory and rings, and there's various stuff about measure theory, uh, there's quite a lot of commutative algebra and bits of group theory. On the other hand, Lean doesn't know that the derivative of sine is cosine at the moment, which is a little bit alarming. Um, so it's kind of patchy which bits of, of the mathematical world have been developed or not. But I think it's pretty likely that an a complete undergraduate curriculum will be there within a couple of years, and a graduate curriculum not so long after that. And it's, it's, the, the things are moving pretty quickly in those directions. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, okay, we've, we've, let's transition to questions and uh, uh, answer this question. Uh, okay, fine. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're uh, a bunch of us are doing it already uh, in various different guises. Um, I've done the relatively unexciting version of taking a small group of good students and teaching them how to use Lean to formalize mathematics. Which is fun, and they've done various cool things. Um, but you're asking about how do we teach our first years to understand what a proof is, I think. Yeah, uh, and, yeah and, and so people... To use this, you have to type check. Yeah, yeah and so we, people have tried this in various ways. So one, one experiment that I think is actually looks really nice, um, Patrick Masseau, who's a symplectic topologist uh, um, at Orsay, uh, has been teaching uh, his sort of first year sort of analysis with Easy Proofs course, where what he's done is he's typed up all the lecture notes. Uh, he, he, what he did is he wrote lean files uh, from which he automatically extracts LaTeX and compiles a PDF. So that if you want just the PDF, you just see the human PDF. But if you view the web version instead, you can click your mouse between any pair of sentences in the human readable text. And what happens is it pops up on the right-hand side of the screen uh, the the goal state exactly this this information here and this means he's not telling the students you need to learn how to program in lean you don't need to learn the syntax you only need to be able to read it that is sort of read the sorts of things that appear here and then the superpower that they suddenly have is they can read a piece of human mathematics but when they're not sure what the steps are doing or what the steps achieve they can click through and, it, and the computer tells them exactly at this point we know this this and this and it remains to prove this Okay, they seem to like it, and it's uh, it's possibly a, a good tool. Um, we've got a, a f I, I don't, but a few um, a f uh, Kevin Buzzard at Imperial and, and Patrick Masseau at, at Orsay have also tried doing a few things where they set up some very constrained piece of mathematics, like proving properties of least upper bounds and the real numbers and so on, where it turns out you can prove everything with just sort of five tactics, and and you can do an exercise with with students where. They learn lean in the space of they learn enough lean to do those problems in the space of a couple of hours. You can do it with first years; it's possible. Um, the people are thinking about doing things, uh, adding basically wrappers around the web interface that prevent you from using the full language, but let you just kind of plug various tactics together to build a proof. Yeah, uh, I'm not so convinced that's a good idea, but people are trying it. Yeah, so. Um, Kevin Buzzard has a has a, a big pile of money for like innovating in first year teaching using interactive theorem proofers. So uh, it's, uh, if people want to do that, they uh, they can do that. I have a question. So has anybody proven something using this system as a tool to explore uh, how to construct their proof, which they didn't already know was True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So something which is then publishable and they could then write a paper on it which they could choose to include or not include some stuff about the lean implementation. So of course ultimately that's where we want to be getting Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely in, absolutely until we get there. But I wonder if you think there are isolated examples of that or not. Not only in, in 
Maths lab, but so there are certainly examples of papers of genuine math papers that that do maths, uh, which grew out of someone's attempt to formalize a published math paper and discovering that it was wrong. We've got some examples of that now. Um, the the um, um, there was there was a there was a paper in hyperbolic geometry. It was a very kind of concrete one about estimates for geodesics and something something something. Where, um, where they genuinely got the paper wrong, someone tried to formalize it and said, like, the inequality at step 17 is backwards. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And they, I don't think that the exploring in the theorem prover significantly helped them find the new proof, but they found the, the, the problem, at least, in attempting to formalize it, and, they, and they, the, the, the new paper includes the, the formal proof. Um, because there is a danger, right, that, that a proof assistant like Lee yep. might be set up to help you uh, in a way that's very helpful for proving something you already know is true, you already know the proof of it, but yep. not maybe set up in an ideal way to you explore whether something might be true or not. Yeah. Right? Which is what um, we do in, in an everyday way as propositions, right? We, we conjecture things to ourselves and we explore. That. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. No. 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 I mean, I definitely. See, I, I, the the students that I had this last semester who were playing with this stuff. I definitely saw them being um, being tempted by the theorem prover to um, to think at too low a level and to focus on the next step of the proof, uh, and you could see that it was dangerous. And a bunch of times, people got stuck proving something, and I sat down with them and asked what was going on, and, and it became very clear that all I had to do was tell them, go up to a whiteboard, tell me the, the structure of the theorem, and, and their problem will be solved. Um, because they had made a little wrong turn and, and were sort of too close to the, the details, because the details were being shown to them in such, such clear detail that they focused on them too much. So yeah, no, I think there, there are definitely traps there. Um, on the bigger picture, uh, yeah, I mean, I think just generally the, the jury's still out. The group, we're gonna have to wait and see. It. The so I would say the multi type theory as well. I don't think there are examples. Really. No, there are no no new theorems. I don't, I'm pretty sure there's no new theorems. Yeah. Um, Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So um, the, there's always this tension uh, when... It, it's very interesting, actually, that the, the way this, the, the develop, developments are structured in Lean. There is this central, reposit, this central library, MATLAB, that we've been looking at here, um, which has quite high standards to get stuff into. Like, there's a, there's, a compl there's a review process, and a lot of people think about everything that comes into it. And so there's a lot of pressure there to do things very well and to do things very generally. So we don't have manifolds yet in MATLAB because the version that's being worked on is an extremely general version that will do manifolds with boundaries and corners and stratifications and structures and everything. And so they're, they're really working on setting things up in a very unified way. But absolutely, yes. I mean, you can do it, and there's a, there's a draft version of it that you can go look at the, the proposal for. Yeah, I mean, no, no obstacle. No obstacle. Do you Get a really machine proof that you would not have thought of? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you have an example of such a thing? Or is it oh, um. If it's not run up top, maybe. Yeah, no, uh, I, mean, I mean, none of them are, I think, none of the examples are, are uh, um, I mean, back for a while had a bug that like it wouldn't apply a lemma that had no arguments if just like the lemma just said exactly what you wanted, and so you would, you would find it doing like these strange circumlocutions to like work around the fact that the lemma really got there, uh, what it wasn't allowed to use. Um, and you do see examples of, of misbehaving tactics working anyway uh, because <laughs> they just are willing to try harder than a than a, than a human would. Um, the. I guess I kind of meant machine -y in, like, a, a 
positive sense. You know, hmm. Something that's like, wow, that's really fake, but I, like it's something that fuels with my heart. Like, I don't think so. Yeah. Not, not, not so far. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, we'll see you later.